Spotlight, lectures and performances on and around Albany State University. Good evening, everyone. Thank you and welcome to the second annual International Studies Lecture Series. This year's series is entitled the second, I'm sorry, the Soriga International Studies in Foreign Language Program. My name is Brittany Humphrey and I'll be presiding over the event and the program will read as follows. Introduction of Speaker by Kaylin Swain. I'm country, you're a bush girl, and that's okay. Rethinking Diaspora Studies in the Translocal by Dr. Imani Berry. <clears throat> and closing remarks by Dr. James L. Hill. And now we have the introduction of speaker by Caitlin Swain. Good evening, my name is Kaylin Swain, a 20 year old junior English major. And tonight I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Dr. Imani Perry. Dr. Imani Perry is a professor in the Center for African American Studies at Princeton University. She is an interdisciplinary scholar who studies race and African American culture using the tools provided by various disciplines, including law, literary and cultural studies, music, and the social sciences. She is the author of the forthcoming book, More Terrible, More Beautiful, The Embrace and Transcendence of Racial Inequality in the United States, as well as 2004's Prophets of the Hood, Politics and Poetics in Hip Hop. And she has also published numerous articles in the areas of law, cultural studies, and African American studies. Dr. Perry is a graduate of Yale, Harvard, and Georgetown Universities, and work and work and her work is largely influenced by several scholarly movements: the Birmingham and Frankfurt schools, critical legal studies, critical race theory, and African American liter literary criticism. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming our speaker tonight, Dr. Imani Perry. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and um, I want to thank Dr. Hill for the invitation. It's great to be here with you guys. I'm going to try and actually not spend too much time talking so we can get into conversation. Um, so many dog dive was I, I had a somewhat longer introduction, but I'm going to go right into the substance of the talk and bring up some issues that that might um, um, I don't know be be interesting and provocative for us all to talk about. Um, so um, jazz pianist Robert Glasper um, has recently become celebrated. He has, he's, he's in his late 30s and he's this rising star in the jazz world. And he's one of a group of Houston-based, um, Houston-reared uh, jazz musicians, including Jason Moran and Jameer Williams, and they've infused jazz with the sensibility of those who've come of age with hip hop. Um, his most recent album, Black Radio, features a host of hip-hop performers. Um, and like um, Robert Glasper, Esperanza Spaulding, who won the Grammy surprisingly for Best New Artist last year, um, eliciting uh, anger from um, believers, um, uh, is a bassist and vocalist from Portland, Oregon, who has also brought a hip-hop sensibility um, and a concern with restoring the popular appeal and a connection to contemporary life to jazz. And her forthcoming album, which will be her fourth, is called Black Radio Society. So that both of these people have titled their albums Black Radio is, is meaningful. And I think they're both kind of responding to and signifying on the state of black radio today as it were. So the consolidation of, of radio station ownership across the country combined with the, the control of a few major record labels who di dictate a huge di deal of the distribution means that most of us wind up across the country and increasingly across the world listening to the same 20 songs a day, um, again and again and again. Um, and both artists are, are suggesting in their work um, that black radio and the distribution of black music might be something different, it could be something better. And I you bring up that metaphor as a way of introducing or getting into what I want to talk about, which is thinking about what if black life could be imagined in terms of distributing something different than what we usually see through what's mass produced? What if for images of Africa were more than what we get in the Coney 2012 viral videos? What if black America was seen in popular media as something more than the latest Young Money song, right? Um, um, what if we're able to connect in ways other than the 20 songs on replay? I want to take us into a journey to look for something more and something deeper. 
Um, Robert Glasper has a beautiful song on his first album that's instrumental titled I'm Country and That's Okay, which really resonated with me. And the point of having to say that it's okay um, is important because to call someone country has been for a long time often a pejorative. Country folk are talked about as being less polished, less sophisticated. But country folk are also more connected to the rituals and practices of a people's survival through hardship, less suspicious of their neighbors, stronger practitioners of traditions. Um, and the other day, <coughs> I said to one of my colleagues, I was limping, and I said to one of my, he said, what's wrong? And I said, I tore up my knee. And he said, um, oh my god, what do you mean? Have you been to the doctor? And I said, no, you know, I tore up my knee. And he said, oh, I forgot you country. You just mean you skinned your knee. And <laughs> I said, right. Um, and I say that for me, the values, the ways of being that I learned from the country part of me, um, origins in Alabama, are things that have allowed me to navigate um, a cosmopolitan world with my soul intact. And so I, I res that song resonates with me. I'm country, and that's OK. Um, and I want to think, so what I want to talk about is that there's parallels to the concept of country that we have here in the rest of the black world throughout the diaspora. Um, in much of continental Africa, it's talked about as being from the bush, right? Um, and that's rural areas that are less Western, that are more connected to traditional practices, um, that are less urban. In the Caribbean, it's often referred to as being from the countryside. Um, often mountainous regions associated with the practice of more explicitly African um, traditions with maroon communities and with more Africanness. period. Um, and like in the, in the United States, areas that are conceived of, imagined as being less sophisticated. Um, and here I want to introduce um, the idea of a, of a cultural theory of translocalism. And it comes from an anthropologist, Clifford Gertz. And what he said is that all meaning is made in local settings and in the context of local experiences. And so what translocalism tries to do is make sense of the relationship between local experiences and global realities and draw connections between them in the sense that they're overlapping experiences and ideas in various locales and they have a relationship to each other. Um, and in the context of the way that people talk about in various parts of the diaspora of being a country or being a bush girl as somehow devaluing, I think this is a means of devaluing traditional lives or those less assimilated um, into Western or upper class markets or lifestyles that are defined as cosmopolitan or superior. And I want to um, take some time to look at some markets for the way women in particular try to transform themselves, black women, as efforts to distance themselves from ideas of being bush or country or ghetto, right, the urban version of it, that cross the lines of the nation state. Right? Um, and so we're, what I want to do is a translocal analysis of some of these phenomenon. And I want to um, do it as a way of thinking about um, the deleterious effect of not thinking it's OK to be country, and also to think about gender and, and, and race in some broader um, senses. So there's a short story um, by a Ghanaian-American writer, um, Nana Ekuabru Hammond, and it's called Bush Girl. And she begins the story with the following words. When I caught my reflection in the blockbuster window that morning, I saw it. I looked like every other girl walking down Flatbush Avenue. My hair was fried, frizzy, streaked with bleach. The ends were split in twos and threes, floating in the wind of that sunny fall day. I had on a Gap jacket, a pair of Levi's, and some Reebok classics. I wouldn't have noticed me. I let the VHS case loose in the abyss of the drop slot and walked home in a stupor. This is a story of a Ghanaian girl living in Brooklyn who sells expensive shoes at a boutique and aspires to high fashion modeling. A number of events pepper the short story. She has an unfortunate experience living with a white model who is extremely successful, so much so that she has to turn down work. Um, and she spends, um, the Bush girl in the story, uh, spends a good deal of money on comp cars and photographs that aren't acceptable to any of the agencies she takes them to. She finds a photographer boyfriend in the middle of the story, and he takes better pictures of her, of her which leads to a little bit of work. Um, she has, an, for a period of time, an illegal alien from who's, she's, I'm sorry, she is an illegal alien, but she has another um, woman 
um, from Ghana come live with her for a time, um, who wants to stay in the United States. And towards the end of the story, her apartment is burglarized. She has a series of events. And throughout the story, in the midst of all these events, we read about her acquisition of material items. She gets a Miu Miu bag, she gets an Anna Sui coat dress, um, and she has this uh, confidence despite the fact that she keeps getting rejected from modeling agencies. Now, towards the end of the story, she says the following after her employer asks her, she quits her job, and, and her employer says, well, am I going to see you in Vogue one day? And she, and, and the story goes, I rattled my head up and down confidently. I've never had a problem with confidence until I caught myself in the blockbuster window that day. <clears throat> um, my hair was reminiscent of Audrey Hepburn's sophisticated street job and breakfast at Tiffany's. My jacket was Gap, but it looked like Helmut Lang. My Levi's fit like Earl jeans. But after seeing myself for what I was in the blockbuster window, I got it. I wasn't special. I was a bush girl, like every other girl walking down Flatbush Avenue. The desire for consumption to remove the signs of the bush takes various forms throughout the lives of black women in the diaspora and on the African continent. Now, one manner of this has been through the bleaching of skin. Um, and several years ago, while working on an article about international markets for skin bleaching creams, largely um, in the Caribbean and Africa I focused on, I scoured the, the um, the aisles of beauty supply stores in every city that I visited. And I found um, not just bleaching creams made for sale in the United States, but those who had, that had labels in French and Spanish, um, things that were, that violated um, the laws for <clears throat> what degree of bleaching agents you could have without a prescription. There was one product from the Dominican Republic on a shelf in, in uh, New York City, which stated that it contained mercury, which is a well-known poison. Um, now, the physical ideal of a lighter complexion, of course, is not limited to the United States and actually is, is maybe more pronounced in Caribbean nations, nations where lighter, lighter skin historically afforded one an official higher caste status, um, and in African nations where it is elite women who have the greatest access to effective skin bleaching creams. Um, now, at the very beginning of this century, around 2001, there were a flurry of international journalistic accounts recounting the horrific consequences of the use of skin bleaching creams by Africans. The articles were from newspapers in South Africa, Zambia, the Sudan, Gambia, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Senegal, and more. Um, and recently, there's been a spate of articles about um, this occurring in Jamaica. The accounts told of permanent disfigurement, general illness, increased levels of cancer, and serious dermatological damage. Now, beauty culture is largely feminized, which is why I talk about this as a, a, a women's issue, although not exclusively. Um, so both historically and today, women have disproportionately used skin bleaching creams. Um, Although the bleaching creams obviously don't make one white, they make one skin lighter, which is closer to the ideal standard of beauty and hierarchy of appearances. And they're also quite prevalent in Asian countries as well. Um, and they're connected to practices that one sees throughout the colonized world of women of color transforming their bodies for the sake of um, approaching something closer to a Western physical ideal. <clears throat> I mean, I, I should also say that I think that at the same time, um, European women have their own um, struggles with, with um, pressure to, to fit a, a physical ideal. But one of the things that um, I, I think we should think about is, is what the, um, the technologies of physical modification do, both in terms of reflecting ideals, but our sense of, of, of individual value. Um, and certainly, this is not limited the cyclical marketing of a desire to not look like what a bush girl, um, a regular black girl, a countryside girl, is not limited to skin. We find it also with hair and the sale of its hair. In Zadie Smith's novel, White Teeth, uh, a biracial 15-year-old girl named Irie, who is living in England, <coughs> experiences shame for her kinky hair and big behind. We say, we should be shamed. She, she does. Um, and she goes to a Jamaican salon um, to have her hair straightened in order to impress a boy she likes. The perm is too strong and all her hair breaks off. And so um, the solution at the salon is that they give her a red colored wig to replace it. Um, and so and it's a humorous set of scenes, but it treats a complicated story. 
Um, in Caribbean writer Jamaica Kincaid's short story, In the Night, there's an Antiguan girl who dreams of growing up to marry, quote, a red-skinned woman with black bramble bush hair and brown eyes who wears skirts that are so big that I can easily bury my head in them. And I've analyzed about this about the story in terms with, of the author grappling with issues of race and sexual identity and gender, but I want to focus in for today on the idea of that red-brown woman with the bramble bush hair. Um, and the way she stands is a sign of, of <clears throat> and baggage of, um, of our 21st, of, of our um, creolized European encounters on our 21st century reality, right? She is perhaps um, simply to be read as a higher status black woman, someone visibly with an admixture, someone with, quote, Indian in her family. Um, and today we see that kind of woman yearned for in music videos, a romantic perfection um, is what is presented in which women often on the coastlines, beaches, with obvious racial admixture, walk near naked. Um, it's a hip-hop neo-colonial fantasy of conquest and desire um, that's distributed through global capitalism and digital culture. Brazil, the Caribbean, Miami, mixed places and mixed women, somehow seen as better. And there's this reverse marketing that's going on too that we have to be aware of. So the image of the black American woman is also presented. Um, black American um, I, uh, female superstars are presented iconically to the rest of the world, Beyonce, Halle Berry. They get marketed as, around the world as superior, right? And our technologies for hair, our celebrities, our clothes and the like are depicted abroad as somehow better than those of local black girls in those other sites, right? <clears throat> but let's stop and think for a moment about here. So, girls in hoods across the United States, thank you, um, seek to replicate the yearning displayed in the island fantasies. They yearn for what um, the image on the video say the boys are yearning for, right? It's a repetition of the desire for this woman with Indian and her family, right? Um, in the black parts of cities, <clears throat> across the country, the stores we see littered about neighborhoods, there are walls covered in hair. Just as in um, my neighborhood, in the West African shops in Philadelphia, there are walls covered with bleaching creams. <clears throat> and they're both behind the counter so that you can't easily steal them. The hair, the human hair has been harvested from temples or sometimes sold by poor women in South Asia. And it cycles through East Asian companies before being shipped to the West. So in India, the practice of, of, um, of, of harvesting the hair comes from tonsuring. And tonsuring is a religious devotion to shave one's head in the Hindu culture, to shave one's head and to make an offering. And every year, over 9 million um, devotees in Hindu temples offer hair to whatever deity that temple is devoted to. And they have their heads shorn to fulfill a vow or a pledge. And in the evenings in the temples, the hair is collected up and it's stored in steel containers and they keep the male hair and the female hair in separate containers. And then it's sold to Chinese companies. Um, and every year, about $136 million of hair is shipped from India to factories in China. And then in China, the, ha the hair from India is mixed, with in is mixed with Chinese hair and it's used to make wigs and extensions, et cetera, for Western markets. <clears throat> Um, and about, um, I don't have the figures for the most recent years, but like about five years ago, $82 million of that was exported to the United States. Now, once it gets to the United States, there's a different kind of ethnic market, right? So <clears throat> there's a documentary called Black Hair by Aaron Rannan, which is, I recommend that you watch, and it's online, although you have to watch it bit by bit. Um, and it shows the role of Korean businesses in distributing this hair that comes from Indian temples and is harvested through China and then comes to Korean beauty supply stores in the United States. <clears throat> um, and so there's this sort of multi-ethnic series of, of marketing. And the names that the hair is marketed by are tell a story, right? Wet and wavy, ocean wave, Rio wave, Indian beach wave often references to water and islands, right? The selling of looking like a fantasy, a hybrid fantasy, a multiracial fantasy to fit in the orders of desire, right? Um, Remy, it's a French word, mm -hmm. an, exotic, an exotic name, like the infamous Rio hair perm. You all are probably not old enough to remember Rio. So Rio <laughs> was supposed to be a natural perm. Um, 
And it sold, it was Rio, Brazil, right? And it sold that Debbie Allen um, sold it through infomercials. Um, and it was sold to this image of sort of Brazilian admixture. And it's supposed to be a natural perm. Now how, you know, um, something could chemically alter one's hair um, with, with, with plants, um, didn't see, you know, but it, it, was, it was very popular. And there was a lawsuit as a result of um, um, the problems with this perm, <coughs> which led to many women's hair falling out and, and permanent burns. Um, and Rio had to pay out significant settlements to many of the women um, who, who were bald after using the product. Um, and then they repackaged <clears throat> after a couple years in, under the name Copa, which was supposed to be suggestive of Copacabana, again, Latin America. Right? So the sale of these type of goods is one type of flow among many in the traffic jam of the great economies of the people, um, people of color in the post-colonial uh, world. Um, now, another, another realm, um, one of the other types of artifacts that we use to mark one as a desirable woman, a woman who has status um, through other kinds of, one other consumer goods, um, comes through knockoff handbags, right? Um, Louis Vuitton, Prada, Red Bottoms, right? Rick, Rick Ross talks about them. Um, so recently, um, Christian Louboutin of the famous Red Bottom Shoes uh, sued Yves Saint Laurent because Yves Saint Laurent wanted to make a shoe with a red sole also. And the lawyers for Le Boutin argued that its trademark red bottom soles um, <coughs> uh, were, um, were proprietary. Now, uh, they lost in court, um, and it was sort of bizarre to say that nobody else could have red bottoms on their shoes. Um, but I think it's fair to say that their fear wasn't even so much about Yves Saint Laurent and wanting to have red bottom shoes, but their fear that there would be, because of the interest in the shoes and the growing popularity, is that there would be an inevitable downscale market flow that would lead to the production of knockoffs. Um, and so we have this scenario where we are all um, encouraged to participate in a kind of costuming an effort to look authentically elite, of higher status, in ways that are conceived of as being more beautiful and therefore of greater human, human worth, right? Um, <clears throat> so one of the ways is, is a series of knockoff, off, um, it's through a series of using knockoff goods. Um, and somewhere beyond, um, before, I want to say, before these items appear on the corner, in the corner store, in New York, they're, they're on corners, in LA, they're in swap meets, right? they're in different places, in different cities. Um, it's important to, to be aware of how they got to that space, right? So, likely, before they, we get our hands on them, there was someone in cramped quarters, likely abused and likely hungry, sewing together the pieces of artificial leather that we carry on her arms, right? In Dana Thomas's book, How Luxury Lost Its Luster, oh, thank you, <laughs> she writes, I remember walking into an assembly plant in Thailand a couple of years ago and seeing six or seven little children, all under 10 years old, sitting on the floor, assembling counterfeit ha leather handbags. An investigator told me, the owners had broken the children's legs and tied the lower leg to the thigh so the bones wouldn't mend. They did it because the children said they wanted to go out and play. The exploitation of the labor of poor people in poor countries to satisfy the desires of poor and middle class people in wealthy countries to look wealthy, right? These are all the residual effects of colonialism and various types of inequality remixed in our contemporary age. And how do we understand all these things in terms of gender? Part of what turns us on, what makes us feel good about ourselves or drawn to others is shaped by the worlds in which we live. That is to say, we negotiate ideas of beauty and value within the grammar of the worlds in which we live. Even as we struggle against its confines, we become bricolores. We have to work with the material that we have. We offer remixes or improvisations upon phrases we know. So I don't mean to, to criticize the desire for red bottoms or a Louis handbag or Remy, right? I'm saying that, that we should begin to think about these issues further. And one way to begin to think about this is to think about the series of human beings who touch and see and are seen within the flow of these gendered goods. 
All must be understood both in terms of where they fit in the production of gendered and racialized meanings and hierarchies of human value. And I think I'm gonna, I actually wanna um, stop soon, um, but, I, but I do wanna say at the very end of the story that I referred to earlier, Bush Girl, the Bush Girl says after she, she experiences this encounter of seeing herself in the reflection and saying that she thought she, was, she looked fancy and she realized she looked like every other girl in Brooklyn, she decides to return to church. And she says she goes back to church because she wants God's specialness to cover her again. And I take this, um, for me, this is another way of saying I'm country and that's okay, which is that an embrace of a sense of who we are and our specialness that comes from our home communities as opposed to the acquisition of things that are supposed to demonstrate that we are somehow different from our points of origin or somehow better um, than the position which the society has ascribed us to using consumer items to do that um, strikes me as ultimately self-defeating. Um, and so I think that affirmation of looking for some place to find specialness um, to cover us in addition to understanding all the people in the process of these flows um, is an important move to make as we think about race and gender in the 21st century. I'm gonna stop there so we can have some time for conversation. Thank you.